Before we get into our text this morning, uh, I want to be able to give you guys just a little bit of a background um, regarding verses 9 through 20, which is the verses that we're going to be going through. Now, depending on the translation that you have with you, um, you may have noticed there's some brackets around the enti- this entire section, or there may have been there may be some kind of a footnote that's been inserted. Now, the reason for this, the reason is because verses nine and twenty wasn't included in the first in the, in the two of the oldest Greek manuscripts and also in about 100 of the earliest manus- manuscripts. Uh, it's not in there, verses 9 and 20. However, it doesn't mean it doesn't, it's, doesn't belong there. It, wasn't, um, it was never there before. Uh, evidence points to the fact that many of the early Christian writers were aware of it, were aware of these verses, and actually referred to these verses and accepted it as genuine. Now, based on the testimony of these first century writers, the recollection of the other apostles, and what the other gospels tell us, it's believed that early in the second century, verses 9 and 20 were added by the Christian church to give an appropriate conclusion to Mark. You see, had Mark ended in verse 8, it would have left a huge hole as to what happened after these women had seen the empty tomb. Because it stops right there. It doesn't, you know, we don't know anything else. And all these things just would have been up in the air. Um, So it's therefore necessary, it was therefore necessary to fill in the blanks, per se, based on all the written and oral testimonies available. Now, I personally agree with the translators, scholars, and teachers who've concluded that the doctrines found in, in this passage are consistent with that taught throughout the New Testament. In addition, there's a lot I think we can learn from in verses 9 and 20. And I have no spiritual reservation or hesitation to teach it. And I hope you don't either as you hear, receive, and spiritually profit from these verses, as you would the rest of the Bible. So now that I've kind of told you a little bit of background um, regarding these verses, Regarding this passage, this is what I ultimately hope that you will leave this morning with. Don't allow the thief of unbelief an opportunity to rob you from the truth of God's word. God's desire is to use you in mighty ways, but you mustn't lose hope. He's alive, sitting with God, and right now at this very moment, He's preparing a place for you in heaven. Please join me, or yeah, join me in a word of prayer as we ask God to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, um, we come before you in thankfulness that we have the opportunity to learn from you this morning, Lord. Speak to us right now, Lord. Soften our hearts, soften our minds. And if there is a cloud of doubt, of unbelief, Lord, maybe may it just be lifted by the time we finish this morning's message. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Mark chapter 16, verse 9. Early on the first day of the week, after he had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him, as they were mourning and weeping. weeping. Yet, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it. Then after this, he appeared in a different form to two of them walking on their way into the country. And they went and reported it to the rest, who did not believe them either. Later he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had been resurrected. 
A rebuke isn't easy to take. If you don't know what a rebuke is, it's, it's a certain way of telling you you've done something wrong. It could be harsh. It can just be straightforward to the point. Um, but what it's meant to do, especially from, if it comes from the Lord or from a friend, someone that cares about you, it has the potential to positively change your life if you receive it correctly. Here's a story I found that illustrates what I mean. When Oral Hershiser was, was in his first season as pitcher of the Los Angeles Dodgers, he had great talent but had not been able to translate that into success on the field. Early in 1984, in the 1984 season, he was struggling with his control. Finally, Dodgers manager Tommy Lasorda called the young pitcher into his office for a verbal confrontation, confrontation, confrontation that Hershiser later referred to as a sermon on the bound. Lasorda told Hershiser that he was capable of much better work than he, than he was doing and that he owed it to the team to reach his potential. Hershiser took the rebuke to heart and approached the game with a new attitude. He went to win the Cy Young Award as baseball's best pitcher in 1988 while leading the Dodgers to a World Series title. If Hershiser had not responded properly to his manager's rebuke, it's staffled that he would have achieved such success to help his team so much. In our text this morning, we're told about the events that occurred immediately after Jesus' res resurrection and about the, ne ne the necessary rebuke he gave to his disciples. Now his first encounter when he arrested, when, when he was resurrected, was Mary Magdalene, which is described more fully in John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. When she reported what she saw to the other disciples, they were still locked up in their rooms, crying, mourning, weeping, feeling bad, guilty for abandoning him, seeing him crucified, seeing him die. Now, due to their emotional condition and the fact that they were living in a time when the testimony of a woman was considered unreliable, the male, these male disciples didn't believe her story that he was alive and that she had seen him. Now, sometime later, verse 12 tells us that Jesus appeared to two disciples walking on their way into the country. Now, this account, now this account, the account of this encounter is also described in detail in, in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 27. Now, when these two disciples reported what they saw to the rest of the disciples, and guess what? They weren't believed either. They just did not believe them at all. Now, eventually, there had to come a time, there had to come a point where Jesus would have to appear to all of his disciples, where Jesus appeared to all of his disciples. When he did, verse 14 tells us that he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Now, taking everything under consideration, Jesus rebuked them for three simple reasons. He was disappointed that they did not take his promise to rise, that he was going to rise from the dead at face value. He was disappointed that they didn't believe the reports coming from the other faithful followers. And according to Luke 24, he was disappointed that even though he was standing right in front of them, even though he was standing right before these disciples, they still had a hard time believing it. They still struggled with doubt. You see, the disciples could have done better in their trust and belief because Jesus had spent the last three years teaching and exemplifying it to them. But unfortunately, they allowed their feelings and emotions to consume them to the point of unbelief and hard-heartedness. 
Now, before I move on, I think it's important to figure out how the disciples got to this point. How did they get here? How did they manage to get to this point of unbelief and hard-heartedness? We have to examine this because honestly, if we're not careful ourselves, we're just as susceptible to find ourselves exactly where we see this, these disciples at prior to Jesus rebuking them. You see, just like them, if we allow ourselves to be dictated by our emotions, they may blind us to the truth of God's word, God's word and promises. If we let our emotions consume us, there's a high possibility that we, we will also fall into the same dark hole of unbelief and hard-heartedness. Especially, this is, especially this is true when something devastating unexpectedly occurs and when the world seems like it's just crashing down around us. After Jesus died, the disciples allowed resignation, mistrust, and guilt to attack, weaken, and ultimately rob their faith. And it, will do the same, and it will do the same to us if we don't regularly hold our emotions against the light of God's truth. Now, right now, I just want to take a moment to share with you three ways to overcome the weaknesses of resignation, mistrust, and guilt. Overcoming the weaknesses, the weakness of resignation. Now, what I mean by resignation is giving up hope when it appears as though the world is falling apart around you. When, the, when it, just, it seems like, you know what, nothing is going good for you. Everything is just going horribly and you just want to give up. If you want to overcome the weakness of resignation, you must focus on the results of serving God. He's used you before, and he will continue to use you to fulfill his purposes. Focus on what he's done already through you and how he's worked through you. He hasn't given up on you. He will continue to use you. Secondly, you must focus on the reality that you are becoming more like Christ. God uses our sufferings to shape us, to mold us, and conform us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. There was one other there, one other, one other there that I guess I, I skipped. But the third one, you must focus on the promises of eternity. Jesus said that He's preparing a place in heaven for us. Treasures are being stored up for us, and we will be rewarded with crowns of glory. To overcome the weakness of mistrust, you must choose to believe God. The devil has used doubt to cause mistrust and disbelief ever since the Garden of Eden. Ever since the devil snuck behind or in front of Eve and deceived her. He's used doubt to, to cause unbelief. Did God really say this? Did God really promise that? And to this day, he still uses the same, the, the same methods, the same schemes. When he tempts you to doubt God's word, his aim is to cripple your Christian walk so you don't live life the life God wants you to, to live. It's therefore necessary to choose not to listen to the devil when he whispers doubts into your ears. You must choose not to stay focused on the circumstances of your trials and tribulations. Instead, you must choose to trust God's word. And thirdly, to overcome the weakness of guilt that comes from reminders of past failures, sins, and shortcomings you must regularly and consistently confess your sins to God. 
you will not be free of, from guilt if there's unconfessed sins in your life. As a child of God, when you sin, the heavy guilt you feel is God's conviction and is meant to be a good thing. Don't look at it as a bad thing. It's when, he, when his hand of conviction is upon you and you feel um, that sin weighing heavily upon you, it's the Holy Spirit telling you that you need to confess and repent of it right now. If you try to live the Christian life with unconfessed sin, you're also giving Satan an ammunition to use against you. Now, listen, I, I completely understand that life can get really hard and tough sometimes, but we, we mustn't let our emotions get the best of us during, these, during those times. We must hold on to the truth of God's word and let him get the best of us. Not our emotions get the best of us, but let God get the best of us. It's very easy. Again, I, I, I've been there. I understand that sometimes something crazy, drastic, devastating happens and all we can think about are our feelings and what we're feeling at that particular moment. But as I said, we have to hold these feelings, these emotions against God's truth. The more we allow God to get the best of us, the harder it will be for the thief of unbelief to break into our hearts and minds. All right, let's uh, move on to verse 15. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to, to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new languages, they will pick up snakes. If they should, if they should drink anything deadly, they will, it will never harm them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will get well. Then after speaking to them, the Lord Jesus was taken up to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word by the accompanying signs. Here's another interesting story that I read that I want to share with you. In, in the 1840s, John Getty left the pastorate of a church in Canada to take his wife and two small children to the South Sea Islands to begin mission work there. After a voyage of, a, of a more than 20,000 miles, they arrived in the new Heb Hebrides Islands in Antium. The island chain was filled with cannibals and more than 20 crew members of a British ship had been killed and eaten just months before the Gettys arrived in the mission field. They faced the difficulty of learning a language that had no written form and the constant threat of being killed. Slowly at first, a few converts came and then soon many more received the gospel. Getty continued his ministry faithfully including translating the entire Bible into the native language and planting 25 churches. For many of those years, Getty labored with little help and little word from home. But God was faithful to his servant. In the pulpit of the church Getty pastored for so many years stands a plaque in his honor which says, when he landed in 18." 48, there were no Christians here. When he left in 1872, there was no heathen. This is what God desires from us. And what we're going to discover here is God's plan for everyone, for the church, for us as believers. Now going back to our passage, after rebuking his disciples, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. 
Here where we find Mark's version, Mark's version of the Great Commission, which is better known from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus intended for this Great Commission to be understood two ways. Firstly, he wanted it to be understood as a command, not a suggestion. And secondly, he wanted, to be, he wanted it to be understood, understood as the mission of the church. As believers, you and I are part of the church. And so this absolutely applies to us. But when you read this passage, don't let it overwhelm you. Don't let it, don't think, oh, I can never do this. I can never follow this command. You don't have to do what I'm doing right now to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Preaching it is simply proclaiming it by allowing the Holy Spirit to use your words and actions. And you don't necessarily have to travel around the world to proclaim it. We've been blessed to live in an age where information is easily obtained with a finger swipe or the press of a button. You can use the technological tools you have at your disposal to share the love of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, and the hope of eternity. You know, I used to think that way. You know, I'm, I'm not a great speaker. I don't know how to communicate with people. I get nervous and I start to mumble and, you know, I, I don't have all the confidence in the world. But when I read this passage, I know that this applies to me and this is something that I need to do. So I, want it, I, I desire to make every effort to be able to do what I can to preach this gospel. He has... He has a plan for you too, and He wants to use you wherever you're at, whether it's in your schools, whether it's, you know, skate park, or whether it's at parties, or whatever, you know. Um, it, it, he wants to use you to preach, to proclaim the gospel. I hope that you understand that, and I hope that you want to be obedient to that. You know, we, I use social media, put this on, you know, put these videos on YouTube to be able to proclaim it to the world. Because you just never know, someone from across the world, you know, maybe in, in a small little town in, in South America is listening to this message for the first time, listening to the gospel for the first time. So, and again, I believe he's using, he can use whatever tools we have to share just the love of God, the gospel. If you're a writer, just write it down and just share it. Just send it out on the internet. You never know who's going who's gonna to read it. Don't let this overwhelm you. Don't let the Great Commission overwhelm you. One day you're going to be face to face with God and he's going to ask you, have you been obedient to what I told you? And what are you going to answer? What are you going to say to him? Lord, I just was too scared. I was too worried. I was just, I, you know, I wasn't a great speaker. I wasn't a great, there's no excuse. If he commands you to do something, he wants you to do it. He wants you to be obedient. If God is really that important to you and you believe what he says is true, you have to be obedient to this particular command from him. Now, again, back to our text, prior to Jesus saying this, the concept of sharing one's faith was unheard of. For them, this was a new and revolutionary idea. What do you mean sharing our faith? What do you mean spreading the gospel? 
you see for most Jews, they were either born into Judaism, and if they weren't, they were converted because they saw that it was a better option. It wasn't a common thing to preach Judaism or even paganism. So this idea was new and as I said, revolutionary at that time. And in fact, this command wasn't really obeyed until persecution forced Christians into different regions where they began to share their faith. In this version, in Mark's version of the gospel, the gospel or good news boiled down to a combined promise of, sal of, a, of salvation and a warning. It says, whoever believes and is baptized, whoever believed and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, some people have concluded that baptism is necessary for salvation. Therefore they, therefore, they infer that just as faith is necessary for salvation, so is baptism. And maybe you've had debates, arguments with those who, who believe that you're not really saved unless you're baptiz baptized. I know I have, and they haven't been, they haven't been easy. But again, it's important to understand and read what Jesus said carefully. You have to read what he said carefully. Jesus did not say condemnation belonged to the one who was not baptized, only to the one who does not believe. Warren Wisby said this, a superficial reading of Mark 16 verses 15 and 16 would suggest that sinners must be baptized to be saved. But this is a misrepresentation, but this misrepresentation disappears when you note that, he emphas that the emphasis is on believing. If a person does not believe, he is condemned, even if he has been baptized. The New Testament makes it clear that the only absolute necessary condition for our salvation is faith and that condition is sufficient anyone who truly puts their trust in Christ will be justified at that very second furthermore we see examples in scripture of people who are saved without being baptized such as the thief on the cross when Jesus said whoever does not believe will be condemned. He was emphasizing that faith was essential for salvation. Therefore, having no faith results in condemnation, not the lack of baptism. Here's what Pastor David Guzik writes. At the same time, it would be terribly wrong to regard baptism as a non-essential. It may not be essential to salvation, but it is absolutely essential, essential to obedience. Jesus told the believer to be baptized, and they must do it. It becomes essential as soon as Jesus commands it. Now in verses 17 and 18, Jesus concludes his final words to his disciples get, by giving them a promise of divine power and protection. The accompanying signs was directed to his disciples and intended to be understood as a promise that they'll have power and protection as they went out and fulfilled Jesus' command to spread the gospel around the world. In the book of Acts, we see how some of these promises were fulfilled. For example, in Acts chapter 5, 16 and 19, tell us of demons being driven out by the apostles. Acts chapter 2, 11, 10, and 19 tell us of new languages or tongues being spoken of, being spoken. 
in Acts chapter 20, 28, we read how Paul was bitten by a viper and survived. Now, although there's no biblical account of anyone drinking poison and surviving, testimony from early church history do tell of an incident of this happening. And in Acts chapter 3, 5, 8, 9, 14, and 19, we're told of healings performed by the apostles through the power of Jesus Christ. Now let me mention real quick. You may run across, or maybe you already have, many Christian cults out there who perform dangerous, some of these dangerous rituals as proof of their faith. You may have seen them on TV or, you know, again, eventually you may run into them. You know, you have your snake handlers and people drinking poison and, you know, just again, as they're doing it to display the amount of faith that they have. These cults have taken this passage out of context and made a show out of it without realizing the danger they're putting themselves and others in. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, and Jesus later affirmed this in Luke chapter 4, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So keep in mind these words that Jesus spoke in verse 18, that they were not intended to establish a test of faith. Don't go out there and go in the middle of the El Paso desert over there by Trans Mountain, Trans Mountain, pick up a rattlesnake or look at the rattlesnake, see a rattlesnake and say, well, the Bible tells me that I'll be able to pick up a snake and nothing will happen to me. Yeah, no, don't test the Lord. Don't, <laughs> don't do that. You just don't know what's, uh, you're putting yourself in a lot. I've seen someone, what happens when someone gets bit by a rattlesnake and it's not, it's not pretty. Don't test the Lord. Now, some may ask, are, were these signs only limited to the apostles? And are they possible today? Well, my answer is yes and yes. I do believe Jesus was specifically addressing his disciples as proof of his power and protection so that it may be recorded in the Bible, in the Bible that we have right now. However, I also believe they are possible today in order to display to unbelievers the, exist the existence of a powerful and loving God. God can do some amazing and powerful things through you. He promises that He's going to work through you, that He's going to work powerfully through you. And I have no doubt that He's doing that to this day. He's using us to show unbelievers his love, his grace, his mercy, his power. Again, I'm, I'm not going to go out there and make it a show so that others may see how faithful I am. He'll use you. Again, and he, I, 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 I believe that he'll make it known to you. Again, you have to be open to that as well. Now, in the last two verses of Mark's gospel, we see that he concludes by telling us what happened. Mark concludes by telling us what happened to Jesus and what happened with his disciples. In Luke chapter, 12, in Luke chapter 24 and in Acts 1, we see additional details about Jesus how Jesus was taken up into heaven. But here's what, we, here's what we're told and what we believe by faith. He was taken up to heaven in his resurrected bodily form, meaning it wasn't his soul or his spirit that was taken away or was taken up. He went in his resurrected bodily form. He went up, that's how he went up to heaven. And he sat down at the right hand of God 
distinguishing, distinguishing him above everything that was ever created in heaven and, in, and on earth. And guess what? We're also told that he's going to return in the same way that, we, that he was seen going into heaven. He's coming back in the same way. And many people are going to see it. We're going to experience it. And it's going to be a glorious time. Now his disciples, on the other hand, took up their, their assigned ministry, preaching the gospel everywhere. Yet, verse 20 is clear that Jesus worked with them to perform miracles through them. You see, the disciples did what Jesus told them to do. And then Jesus did what only he could do. This is an ex excellent example or an excellent pattern for ministry. The preaching came first and then the signs following. Signs are meant to follow believers instead of believers following after signs. Now, as we end Mark's gospel here, for this past year, we've gone through, we've gone through this entire book. We've gone through it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Together, we've read, studied, read and studied his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. My question to you is how has God changed you through it? Since we started a year ago in Mark chapter 1, how has it changed you? How have you grown as a Christian? Have you developed into... Have you developed a deeper relationship with the Lord? Or has it just been a waste of your time? You have to ask yourself these, these, these questions. I can personally tell you that in my study and, and my preparation to present it to you, God has brought me into a deeper understanding of who He is and his immense love towards me. And I hope that he's done the same for you. Now, although our journey through Mark has ended, the message of Jesus Christ found within these pages will last for all of eternity. So keep it close to you. Treasure it. Fall in love with it. One day soon, as I mentioned, he will come back and we will be with him for all eternity. If he came back right now, this instant, would you be ready? Or would you have excuses? Would you be full of excuses for why you weren't, obe why you weren't obedient? Why... You didn't share your faith. Again, I urge you, don't let that be you. Fall in love with the gospel. Fall in love with it as you would fall in love with any person and just tell anybody about... I know when I first started dating my wife, I wanted to tell everyone about it, told the whole world. That's how it should be with your relationship with Christ. Don't be ashamed. If you're currently in a really hard place, don't lose hope. Don't make the mistake the disciples made. If you trust in God's truth and promises, the thief of unbelief will not defeat you. Paul tells us in Romans 8.18, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. The Gospel of Mark is the good news of Jesus Christ. 
And what is this good news? What is the good news? Now, from the New Living Translation, here's how Paul put it, put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed, you welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. Firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe in the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what, what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead. On the third day, just as scriptures said. Simply put, Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for our sins so that we might become children of God through faith alone, in Christ alone. And who is this gospel for? Who is the good news for? It's for both the believer and the unbeliever. For the believer, the gospel is a reminder of God's love towards us. And for the unbeliever, the gospel offers hope of salvation. Regardless of where you're at spiritually, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for you. Now, if you're watching or listening and you've never been forgiven of your sins and would like to have that assurance of salvation, in a brief moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus into your heart. If you've never done that, or if you doubt your salvation, don't go another day doubting where you're going to spend eternity. Don't go another day without knowing whether you're saved or not. Again, this gospel message is for you. Jesus died and rose for you. And you can have the assurance of salvation by simply accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Again, if you're watching or listening and you realize that this gospel is for you and you want to accept Jesus into your heart you want to be saved you want to have that assurance of spending eternity in heaven with the Lord wherever you're at just pray this out loud or in the quietness of your heart. Holy Father God, I realize that I'm a sinner and that I've done some bad things in my life. I'm sorry for my sins and today I choose to turn from my sins. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ died for me, was buried, and rose again. I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I choose to follow Him as my as Lord for this from this day forward. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. Save my soul and change my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that with the sincerity of your heart, He knows. The Lord knows what's really going on in your heart. If that's you, I urge you and I recommend to go out and find a church that teaches the Bible, the whole Bible, Not pieces of it, not parts of it, but the whole Bible.
He's going to do some amazing things through you. Just trust Him. And Heavenly Father, as we close this morning's service, I want to thank you for for giving me the privilege of teaching the entirety of this gospel, Lord. Lord, you've been patient with me. You've been patient with the listeners as I presented it. I know at times it was difficult, it was hard, but again, it's you that's working through it, Lord. It's an honor for me to be used in such a mighty way. I pray that this past year as we've gone through Mark, that it did change lives, that it did, that there were things that just stayed and sank and planted and were planted deep within the heart of those that are here, those who have been here. And I pray that they, that that seed will just grow and that fruit will be, will be born of it, Lord. Thank you for getting us to this point, Lord. It's by your grace and mercy that we've gotten here. And as we continue into our next book, into our next message, Lord, be with us also. May we grow as individuals and we may, we may, may we grow as a church. Use us in a mighty way, Lord. Continue to use us. We love you. We praise you. forever, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.